Peter Doe has been the designer on everyone's lips this past year, and though his debut at Helmut Lang wasn't the most successful, his namesake has been growing from strength to strength. But the question is, why? What is so special about Peter Doe that makes the brand stand out against the plethora of other minimalist brands? Peter Doe as a company was established in 2018, but the branding that we know today had begun a lot earlier, at least four years prior in fact, thanks to his Instagram and his Tumblr even before that. Unfortunately, images of the Instagram page are lost now, but it's these very graphic images that clearly communicated his vision that began to get him noticed by more than just Instagrammers, but by industry insiders after he used them to win the Graduates Award in the inaugural LVMH Prize for Young Fashion Designers. It was specifically this ability to transfer his ideas into striking images that would be his early differentiator. As when that was translated to Instagram, he had amassed a following of 45,000 people during his time interning at Phoebe Philo's Celine and then his work placement at Derek Lamb, but before officially showing any show or lookbook under his own name. Which meant that by the time that he was ready to begin his journey, he already had a defined aesthetic and an audience to whom he could market and experiment ideas with, even showing behind the scenes content in order to aid authenticity. However, while the visuals are clearly from Doe himself, it would be disingenuous to say that the company was exclusively Peter Doe's. It is not. It was actually founded by a group of five people named Jessica Wu, who worked PR, Lydia Sukato, who managed operations and logistics, Vincent Ho, CEO, and second designer Anne Nguyen, who all met online through sites like Tumblr. Together, they founded Peter Doe as a company and used Doe's name in the tradition of fashion houses as he was the creative director, but probably also because he had the largest social media following as well. Their first collection, Spring Summer 19, was produced as a lookbook and it was wildly successful. Without a show, presentation or formal press attention, they had nine confirmed stockists including Dover Street Market in London, Ginza and New York, and Netta Porte who had an online exclusive for their first two seasons. They obviously made very good sales and it's easy to see why. They had a considered point of view, extremely commercial and yet special garments made in a unique fabric known as Spacer, which was specifically made for the company to make these quote normal clothes made more interesting, and they even had accessories like bags, socks and jewellery as entry point products. So for buyers, it was an easy bet and saw them take half a million dollars in their first season alone, something just unheard of in fashion. From here, Jessica Wu would capitalise off Peter Doe's successful career before this, touting his work experience at Celine under Phoebe Philo, which he actually won as a prize from the LVMH Graduates Award, and his time under Derek Lamb in order to bring attention to the label, give provenance to their aesthetic choices, and boost their profile exponentially with articles with major outlets like ID, WWD, Document Journal, and Refinery29. Even Vincent Ho had an article on Coverture for his Alexander McQueen collection, which they used as a gateway to promote Peter Doe. However, especially interesting was their use of terms in these articles, which are all so similar that they actually come across as press releases instead of journalistic articles, so it reads as if they were purposefully using terms like Celine on sale when discussing their pricing, as a way to clearly market the brand, as a way to rediscover the now absent Phoebe Philo Celine at an affordable price point, while reminding the consumer of the provenance of the Peter Doe name. This came with a lot of weight, which I go over on my Phoebe Philo video on Patreon if you're interested in understanding why this was such a powerful brag. But basically, it was clear that they knew fashion celebrities would help legitimize their business and they used the names that they could to bolster their brand in a manner that very clearly worked. Really, the only annoying thing about this was that all of these early press releases are so extremely similar that there's little new information in any of them. 
There's certainly things like manufacturing facilities, logistics, and how on earth they could afford all of this that are nearly always the biggest hurdles for small businesses, but are never discussed that I could find. And it's the absence of these discussions and the early success of the brand that I think deserves more research. There's puzzle pieces missing here. How did they do this so well, so early, and without struggle? Despite the information being missing, it was very clearly successful. And by their second collection, it was clear that Peter Doe was a company that knew what it was doing. Not just in press, but in retailing. The repeated themes such as this backless detail, the straps, the spacer fabric, neutral colour palette, the pop of colour, the focus on tailoring, bags. Really, this collection was an extension of the first, but was clearly curated with the acknowledgement of what had sold well in the previous season and therefore obviously played into what the buyers and consumers would want to see perfectly, doubling their market appointments on their first season. Thus, continuing to sell phenomenally well, becoming one of the best sell-throughs for a new upload for the Net-A-Porter site, despite only 40% of the collection being uploaded yet. Interestingly, it was also in this season that the brand began marketing themselves more with New York as well. They'd been based there and run an office out of New York. However, the previous set of images were actually released in Paris Fashion Week, perhaps as an ode to Phoebe Philo's Celine, yet this season, the term New York came up very regularly in PR articles to give that sense of world building that proves so successful with online marketing. This would obviously go on to be part of the Peter Doe DNA, so much so that it influenced heavily his Helmet Lang debut, which we will get onto later. That's because over really the next four seasons, that definable aesthetic started to become expanded and not necessarily in a good way. The collections grew in size quite a lot with Spring Summer 20 having 39 images, Autumn Winter 20 having 45, Spring Summer 21 with 45 again, and Autumn Winter 21 with 46, more than tripling their debut of a 13-image collection. Obviously, this was because there was demand to be fed, but they started to see a little creative critique due to how expanded the collections as a whole had become. Some felt as if they were throwing a lot of ideas at a wall to see what stuck, and as a result, that definable aesthetic became just a tad diluted in this time. However, with that said, the main core was able to be defined, as neutrals, minimalism, and wearable clothes made more interesting. So the Peter Doe branding hadn't really been lost, they were just trying, perhaps a few too many, new things. Almost in a way, it seems they were trying to preempt the critique that their themes are quite common amongst other minimalist brands, and so are trying to find something that could be uniquely theirs. However, more than the clothes themselves, it was their promotional prowess that really set them apart during this time, for which the role of the pandemic cannot be underestimated. While other fashion companies were forced to translate their whole world online, Peter Doe had already done exactly that working their social media through this use of incredibly graphic, almost polaric images that catch the eye of the internet user, giving it a cohesive look, even if the pieces themselves perhaps were a bit sporadic. All of which saw that after Spring Summer 21 was presented on Instagram TV, they had reached 193,000 followers on Instagram by March and 300,000 before their next show, by which I mean Spring Summer 22, in June 2021. The product was decent, sure, because of the scale they had something for everyone, but it is that initial visual arrest that makes a consumer stop and take a look in the first place. Then with their affordable price point and wearable offering, it's very understandable how that transferred, like the funnel that is in the marketing funnel, into sales. Meaning that by Spring Summer 22, they were ready for a risk at presenting their first fashion show something they didn't quite have as much control over the images of. On paper, everything about this collection is done phenomenally well. The presentation is clean, natural, the clothes are very saleable, and there are many themes that are carried through from previous collections. It was even presented in their New York home to continue their world building. However, I think for me personally, in their efforts to be more commercially viable, they played it too safe. 
and as a result didn't have that arresting factor that was in their curated Instagram imagery. I think AO at Fashion Roadman explained this best when he said that Peter Doe didn't really make safe garments before. They were commercial because they were classifiable garments like a jacket, a dress, a skirt, and so thus they were wearable, but they weren't safe because they were subverted. This subversion technique was notably reduced in this collection, and that took the garments to that safe space, which made the collection not as strong as it perhaps would have liked to have been. Don't get me wrong though, it was a well-conceived idea, it was received well critically from both critics and fans, and I'm sure it sold phenomenally well as well. But for me, it wasn't until Autumn Winter 22 that their catwalk presentation would have the same visual impact as the lookbook imagery before them. This was really a pivotal point for the brand. So far, they had more or less marketed themselves on the celebrity names of Peter Doe's work experience at Baby Philo Celine and Derek Lamb, and the several celebrities that had worn Peter Doe clothing thus far. However, this was now four years after the brand first began, and those that knew the brand had long been saying that they were leaning too much on the achievements of others to bolster their own brand. Great idea at first, certainly helped to get their foot in the door, but now people had started to look at his work more critically, something that AO at Fashion Roadman and Fashion Lover 4 speak about in their reviews, even with Fashion Roadman quoting Alexander McQueen, who spoke on this idea of provenance in fashion and how that can make critics overlook some of the negative parts of a designer's work. So in short, it was now in this collection that they needed to carve out their own identity away from other brands. This is obviously quite difficult in minimalism where a lot of the same references are found. However, he did manage to find his own style within that in a kind of nouveau minimalism way. It was a helmet lang but reinvented for today's consumer. And yet, it still didn't stop these many, many comparisons to other companies, and so didn't quite reach the level of uniqueness that they needed to be completely distinct. And really, they still wouldn't stop for Spring Summer 23. But thanks to one very on-brand stunt, they would have the perfect solution. Celebrity. Throughout all of this time, Peter Doe had been seen on several celebrities from Zendaya to several K-pop celebrities, with this catwalk being the height of their endorsement as Gino from NCT opened the show, making him the first K-pop star ever to open a New York Fashion Week catwalk show and was followed by several other SM Entertainment rookies, Shaw He and Eun Sok, and even Sergi of Red Velvet was also in attendance in the audience. Plus, as a whole, this was the best curated collection so far. I don't doubt that commercially it did well as well because it has a large following and because the collection had so many things there was probably something for each of those followers and something each buyer knew would sell. Plus it was incredibly smart of them to put Gino in their most definable silhouette, this incredibly nipped waist backless tailoring to draw attention to their main aesthetic as a brand as a way to highlight that they actually are different to the other minimalism brands that are on the market at the moment. And yet, though comparisons were their biggest weakness at this point, it soon would gain Peter their appointment at Helmut Lang, adding another layer of provenance to the company, potentially turning their biggest weakness into their biggest strength. But it actually hadn't been announced just yet. That wouldn't happen until May 2023, after their Autumn Winter 23 collection. Autumn Winter 23 was suspiciously quiet, and although this is a topic no one from the brand has spoken about publicly that I could find, I can only imagine that this was very purposeful. They are, as you may have noticed from how little I've included statistics, very tight-lipped about the inner workings of the company, and we know now with hindsight that the Helmut Lang appointment was about to be announced, so it's a reasonable guesstimate that this collection was purposefully subdued in terms of promotion in order to allow them time to work on the deal and not to distract from the impending announcement. Also, I expect the appointment heavily affected design as well as they continued 
quite heavily down the Spring Summer 23 aesthetic that drew so many comparisons to Helmut Lang in order to create that visible parallel which it undeniably did very successfully. But unfortunately, that was a bet that didn't really pay off. The buzz before their Helmut Lang debut was palpable, but unfortunately their debut wasn't particularly well received. It had a lot of the same criticisms as the mainline 2020 to 2021 collections in that it was a lot of ideas mashed together without a real sense of identity. I have already produced a video on Helmut Lang's label if you would like to see how they affected the brand in greater detail, and actually the comments under that video are wonderfully insightful to the consumer mindset with this debut. Perhaps it was simply due to this expectation that it was impossible to live up to. But in my opinion, it was because Peter Doe, the brand, is really at this pivotal point where they're halfway between securing codes and trying to find new ones, which is something usually done well before a brand has this much fame. So without really concreting that, to have to do it to a second brand, which though does have the same creative director, is still their competitor as a business, is just now going to be all that more difficult. And yes, I realize I'm focusing in on this one detail quite a lot, but that's because from a consumer perspective, they need to think what exactly it is that will make a customer buy Peter Doe over Helmut Lang or The Row or Victoria Beckham or one of the many other minimalism competitors. Right now, they have this silhouette, but is that enough to make you think that this Spring Summer 24 collection couldn't have come from someone like Christophe Lemaire? From my perspective, I see this as their biggest flaw with the company at the moment, one that is quite particular to minimalism brands, of course, but in my opinion, the time that is usually afforded to new designers to work out what works for them and for their consumers has been severely reduced thanks to their, albeit incredible, PR and online presence. And actually, on paper for now, everything is fine. To use the four P's of marketing, my favorites, Obviously, the price is good, it's on sale Celine. The place is good, they have a lot of stockists. Promotion is phenomenal, easily the reason the company is so well known today, and the product on the surface is great as well. But it is that experimental time that they need and cannot have because they've reached a level of fame. But perhaps that's exactly what the Autumn Winter 23 break was for, and it really did do wonders for getting back to making a definable aesthetic which meant that by spring 2024, the vision was far more concise and put together than ever before. Their most famous themes were of course returned, tailoring, a limited color palette, the pop of color, even the backless detail, and there were far less superfluous clothing in this collection. Simply the absence of clothing that wasn't completely on brand shows maturing in their not design work, but their curation of what is presented to the consumer. However, when you revisit the competitor analysis, of which I actually did a few for this, you can quite clearly see that their point of weakness is also their greatest strength. They're a brand now with a definable aesthetic. They're able to be put into this minimalism box, which is surprisingly good for consumers, especially now with search features online contributing to how a company brands themselves. They have great marketing and they've got great stockists. But the fact that they aren't particularly unique is quite a heavy point of weakness. There's The Row, Victoria Beckham, Jill Sander, Helmut Lang, Isabel Moran, Tom Ford, Alix, even Phoebe Philo just debuted her own label. And there are also brands like Kos, Uniqlo to an extent, Zara, Joseph on the high street that are all quite similar in terms of what they put out only really defined by their marketing and their price points. And considering the brand really had its start by being compared mostly to Phoebe Philo, that's going to be a very hard box to break out of to find their point of difference. Because quite frankly, they aren't going to be the new buzzy brand forever. So when that shiny object syndrome effect is lost, they will need something substantial to back that up. They need that smash hit product, that cash cow, to back up the brand. Luckily, the brand isn't fully formed yet, not by any means. 
And because of the phenomenal marketing and understanding of high margin items from the beginning, like socks, vests, bags and earrings, it has both allowed the brand time and money to develop their own aesthetic and hopefully will allow them to continue developing their company with partnerships such as the new Banana Republic collection. Most brands do this before they reach this level of fame, of course, and it seems their journey has been a double-edged sword because of that. But I'm still really interested to see which direction the main line goes in, purely because they finally seem to have begun to really genuinely understand their consumer, find their voice for them within this minimalism box, something that undoubtedly came in handy for their Banana Republic collection that debuted today, as it so well fits into this new curated world of Peter Doe. It was even featured in the Spring Summer 24 collection. There were no superfluous or off-brand items in either collection, Banana Republic or Spring Summer 24, whatsoever. But there were many high margin items like the vests and the shoes that I'm sure will turn this into a very profitable partnership. I'm glad the company has finally started to hone their voice. It's not fully crystallized just yet, but I do look forward to that from the team. There's certainly room to grow, and because they have made such a healthy company behind the aesthetic, they can really afford to do that. Plus, now thanks to Helmut Lang, an even larger influx of funds will help steer the design into a communicable place. I really expect the brand to do great things in the future. I have no doubt they will be one to stick around and eventually perhaps get sold on to Prada or PVH maybe. Thank you so much for watching. Please do like and subscribe. For more videos like this one but about beauty brands, check out my beauty channel Underskin and a special thank you to my Patreon patrons, some of whose names are on the screen now. For a link to my Patreon, please check the description box below.